hello, hello, and welcome to the show today on Awaken and Ascend. I have the privilege of being able to host Stuart Elliott, who currently lives in South China with his mm-hmm. wife and his two children. He's been dubbed as the soul whisperer, guiding you to fully activate your inner potential. So today we're going to tap into those possibilities that we all have inside. And as Stuart Elliott says, it's truly amazing what you can achieve with the right guidance. So I am so glad you are here and all tuning into this. And welcome, Stuart. It's so wonderful to have you here today. Well, Jennifer, it's an honor, an absolute honor. And, uh, you know, it's it's wonderful to be here and uh, be given the opportunity to share some things with some of your guests and uh, guests and audience and uh, the people who support you. So thank you so much for that opportunity. I appreciate you being here. And it's really interesting journey that you've been on. I hear a different kind of accent. I'm imagining that you've had some travel experiences. Curious how you ended up in South China. Well, yeah, I mean, I think everybody has their own personal journey. And mine started obviously in the UK. That's my accent. And it has been ameliorated quite a lot since then because of my travels. But back in 86, I decided... I was going to do an overland trip, a six-month overland trip from South Africa back to the UK through Africa by road. And six months later, I mean, we had a wonderful time. We haven't got time to go into every single thing here, but we had a wonderful time. But when I got off the ferry, I said, no, I don't like it. I'm going back. So three months later, I was back in Africa, and I lived there for 18, 19 years before life sort of happened. You know, things change and, and things fall apart and out with the old in with the new type of thing and then I uh, was given an opportunity to come over here to China to teach English so I said okay great but where north or south if it's the north it's like the frigid wastelands of of, uh, Canada you know very very cold and I'm not interested in cold (laughs) they said no no it's not too far from Vietnam it's a place called Nanning so I said no problem and uh, that was, you know, close to 20 years ago. And uh, I've been here, been here ever since. And that was a big part of my journey, big part of my awakening as, as, as the African trip was. And uh, also part of the education to find my true calling. To find your true calling. And it really takes yeah. a journey and a lot of yeah. twists and turns and pivots that we take. And for you, it's been through different countries and exploring the possibilities that exist within each of those. And becoming aware of new potentialities for what life could be like and how to, who to surround yourself with and what kind of work you wanted to be doing. So there was this opportunity to be able to teach English. And mm-hmm. is that what you're still doing? Or how did you no, become no, a soul I, whisperer? I, I, I moved on from that, you see. I think that the, the opportunity, exploring the opportunities wasn't necessarily happening at the time. I was just on this, this journey. And that was part of my education, if you like. And it's only latterly that I, I've recognized the value of a lot of the events and things that have happened to me. So that, that sometimes it takes us a little bit of time to do that. But what happened with the teaching was, I mean, I learned a lot and I was taught some fantastic lessons by the students. And uh, as I got to the later um, stages of the teaching, I was working in a private school with um, midlife, um, younger sort of uh, 20, 25-year-old students who are getting ready, number one, either to emigrate, number two, uh, go study in the UK or States or somewhere like that, and number three, who are doing overseas business with those countries. So they had, number one, a higher level of English. They had more maturity and more confidence in themselves to be able to ask questions, and they trusted me, and they started asking me quite quite deep questions because they were smaller classes. And it, it turned out that... I became their coach rather than their English teacher. (laughs) So I said, okay, when they made those changes and and they had that big smile from the heart, as people do when they suddenly find the solution to a vexing problem, then I said, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. So that was how I realized the transition. And then I look back, you know, as I do, and all the things that have happened are part of that educational process in my coaching field because it's so many things that you know have happened and we haven't got time to go through everything but it is 20 to 30 40 years of travel through different countries in Africa and then um, China that have given me so much wisdom 
it's so interesting what emerges, you know, that we're doing mm-hmm. one thing and then something else comes from that. It's part of the transformation, I think, is transcending mm-hmm. form that existed yeah. before moving into what you're feeling called to. And I find it interesting, too, that it was the students that brought in this realization, this awareness, because so often we look to the elders and our ancestors for the gifts and the answers and for guidance mm-hmm. and for their wisdom. And I think it's really interesting and important, too, to look to our descendants, because they, too, carry so much information and see the world differently and can offer perspectives and inspiration. And I think all generations have something to offer, wouldn't you say? Everybody has value. Everybody has their own wisdom. Unfortunately, for many people, we don't see that. I mean, if you look at very, very young children, they can teach you so much if you're open to the lessons. And quite often we're so wrapped up with our own busyness that we don't see that. We just see the children as a nuisance. Mm-hmm. And you know, um, I, I, I had that issue once when there was a, an eight-year-old boy in one of the classes. It was a small class of about 10 people. And I was trying to teach, I can't remember what the point was. I was trying to teach something and he just didn't get it. So I repeated it again a little bit more uh, with a bit more volume, a bit more force. He still didn't get it. And I did this about three or four times and he started shrinking and disappearing. And eventually I got frustrated with myself and said, look, he's stupid, Stuart. I said this in my mind. He's stupid. He's never going to get it. Leave him. So I just basically ignored him for the rest of the lesson. And then afterwards I did a review of the lesson. I said, Stuart, you know something? He's not stupid. You're acting stupid. He's just shown you five, six times. He doesn't understand the way that you're teaching this. Uh-huh. So I went back to the class the next day, you know, for the next class, and I taught the same thing from a totally different direction. You should have seen his eyes light up. He was the happiest person in the world. Wow. So what a beautiful lesson to be given by the eight-year-old that he needs to hear it this way, and not everybody needs to hear the same thing the same way. It's my job. I've got the message to share to find out the way that they need to hear it so that they can take it on board. And that's so true in every direction of life, but people don't always see that. Mm. It's my way. You must understand. If you don't, there's something wrong with you. Yeah, and that, don't always that see that. You don't always hear that and listen. Yeah. yeah. So, so you know, we, we just step outside of ourselves. Yeah. Yeah, to be able to step outside of ourselves. And I think we often talk about being seen and heard. And I think there's also something about being heard and held. Yeah, holding the space for others to be seen and heard and share their gifts and their perspectives and and truly be present with that, you know, present with each other. How many people really hold the space? That's the big question. Yeah, even for ourselves, Stuart. Mm -hmm. How do we hold space for ourselves, you know? It is about stepping outside of, of ego, of everything else and just stopping. And the thing is, you know, a lot of people, if they, they, if they do stop, they step straight into judgment. So we've got to be able to take away the judgment, just say, okay, and accept whatever's happened. And then we can move on in a much more positive way. But judgment is a, is a very close companion to so many people. I mean, I've, I've suffered that many, many times. <laughs> just yeah, like with that yeah. child, I said, I judged him. <laughs> You know, but he he told me otherwise when I, I took time to, to just stop and listen. So it's an interesting thing. And in that space, there's also this opening for possibilities, mm-hmm. new perspective, oh. things that mm-hmm. we hadn't thought of before or not in the yeah. same way before. You know, we start to literally see things differently and hear things differently mm-hmm. and be able to receive that and see what else is possible with that information. You know, something yeah. that you've been quoted for is it's amazing what can happen under the right guidance. So mm-hmm. how do we discern right guidance? I think that's a very personal choice because, you know, especially if you look at the coaching sphere, You form a very intimate relationship with your your people, whoever you're coaching, whether it's as a pay coach or a friendship or something like that. And the coach has to be able to step outside of their ego and, as you say, hold space for you, but hear, really hear, 
not prescribed to you, but really hear what you're experiencing. Mm -hmm. And that is the, the big thing. Once we can hear, I mean, that, you know, what the client or, you know, the, the coach he may be saying could only be the surface level, but that's what they are experiencing. Mm -hmm. Once you can get that and you can get that acknowledgement, then you could start to have that conversation, which allows them to go deeper. And notice I said, allows them to go deeper. Because again, it's not about uh, prescribing, it's about encouraging that open conversation and, and helping them to explore Yes. And then we, once we do that, then the world is our oyster, as they say. And once again, it's not for me to, to provide an answer as a coach. I can make suggestions, I can sow seeds, but it's up to the coachee to find the answer for themselves because they have the answers already. It's just they don't know how to access them. Yeah. And it's really something to be able to filter out the information as well. We live in mm -hmm. such an stimulating world where there's information coming from so many different sources constantly mm -hmm. all the time mm -hmm. not to mention all the thoughts and <laughs> beliefs we have going on in yeah. our head and our own self-talk and in a conversation so it's becoming increasingly challenging to to be present to really listen to hold mm -hmm. that space and we are multi-sensory beings having this multidimensional life where we're experiencing life on so many different levels and through all of our senses all the time. And part of my mission and with this show and the guests that come on is really supporting each other and integrating, mm -hmm. integrating, because integration is such a powerful process that we must go through to be able to really take in and receive all that might be useful for creating the future that we want and be able to live life more fully, but integrating mm -hmm. a higher consciousness model of living. Mm -hmm. And that really takes an, aware an awareness, uh, uh, quite often rites of passage that we must go through and almost a rebirth, mm -hmm. a realigning with our values and our vision and our mission to be able to support that. And as you mentioned being able to hear the call because you spoke about how this work that you're doing now was a calling for you. So how do you think a calling is different from like a, a pursuit or a career or trying to figure out, you know, what our purpose is and what we must be doing? Because yes. for me, it's really about moving from a place of passion and not obligation. <clears throat> and quite often our motivation is from fear of guilt or obligation. You know, we're living in, in that sense? Now, that's a very, very difficult question to, to give a single answer to because mm -hmm. I think it's, everybody is different. And what I found with my life is when I was younger, I was focused on certain things. Like, you know, when I left school, my, my goal was to get a motorbike. And that's what I did. And then my goal was to go to Africa. So that's what I did. I didn't have any idea. I mean, when I, I was 15, I went to, um, uh, what do you call it? A, uh, a career class or something like that. And they say, what do you want to do? I don't know. I just want to do something with electricity. I haven't got no idea what I want to do, but I knew I had a, an interest in that field. And what I found was that took me on my journey because I ended up working for British Telecom or as it was at the time, Post Office Telecommunications going to people's houses, fixing their phones. And you may think there's nothing to learn there, but I was intimately involved with people in their own private abode. Mm. And much later, I realized how much I learned about people, mm -hmm. how much I learned about communicating with them in a different way than I would have done just by meeting them on the street or whatever. So I somehow made that choice or was pushed in that direction for that education, which I didn't realize until much later. Again, as a young child, I was very, very shy. And I would go to parties at 14, 15 or whatever, and I'd be praying for people to come and talk to me because I couldn't talk to them. But once again, I thought that was a curse, but that was actually a blessing because I was learning 
body language. I was learning nonverbal communication by looking at the people and, and thinking, okay, this person, she's very, or he's very um, outgoing, but he's, he's not sincere. And, and everyone else was thinking they were the life and soul of the party, but they were hiding something because they were also shy. So I learned so much in that respect. So, you know, that's one message I always share with people is that shyness is not necessarily a curse. It's actually a blessing in disguise, but you don't necessarily know how at that moment. Mm -hmm because you've got that training. And I think what happens is we get glimpses, maybe, but we don't put them together until things have happened, because we've still got that growing to go. We've, we've got to step into that truth about us. And, you know, very often, I mean, I, I've been labeled a soul whisperer, but we all have messages from our soul. It's, it's constantly there, but we, we very often ignore them, because we've got something, as you say, much more focused like my motorbikes or like these days people with the games or the mobiles or whatever the distraction is and it can take a life um, event sometimes a significant one or a series of things for people to to get that um, connection back again to themselves and i think that's where coaches can come in they can help if they're good coaches they can help you connect back to yourself and then start exploring that side away from the distraction. Um, the other thing I would like to suggest is, I ask a lot of people this and they look at me as I'm crazy, but is what is it we use to, we listen, to listen with? Mm. And most people look at me and say, well, you know, what's wrong with you, your ears? Mm. So I say, well, why not listen with your whole body? Mm. Mm -hmm. And that stops them because it's something we've not been taught. Right. So much of communication is, is energetic. I mean, even sound is energy, but, uh, you know, it, it is the, the messages they give out. And we know that um, even from thousands of miles away, a parent can know that their child overseas has been involved in a, a serious incident and they, they get yeah. this message. And we all have ways of, of, of picking up these messages, but we're not necessarily aware of it. And so often we say it's a coincidence. But I don't think there's anything, there's any such thing as a coincidence per se. I think, you know, these are messages that we connect to, but we just don't, we're not taught how to, to interpret them. And, and you know, we're, we're often in a situation where if you admit it, then you're considered crazy. So we keep it down. But, you know, very, very young children, again, going back to them. They have these messages, they have this ability, this wonderful ability. And if we observe them, we can see so many things that they can teach us. I mean, my youngest daughter, she was um, just over three and she went to kindergarten and they had a um, basketball uh, competition. So they, we got a basketball for her and she was so excited and playing basketball and she'd come home, she's always bouncing. But this is something that, that blew my mind. She would come home at three and a half years old and she'd be bouncing. And she soon, within you know, 15, 20 minutes, was up to 100. Wow. And then one, one evening she came home, she's bouncing away like she was doing. And I noticed it's winter and she's got no shoes on. So I said, please put your shoes back on. So, you know, bounce, 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 bounce. She bends down, picks a shirt, puts it on the other foot, changes hands, bounce, 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 picks up the other shirt, puts it on her foot. She didn't stop once. She didn't break stride. Oh, she just knew she could do this. Wow. And then a bit later, her nose is running. So I said, please get a tissue, blow your nose. Over to the counter, bounce, 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 picks up the tissue. The box falls on the floor. So she bends down, picks it up. She's still bouncing. <laughs> she didn't break stride. Then she eventually blew her nose after putting the, the box back on the counter, went to the rubbish bin, still bouncing, and put the tissue away. Now, I don't know about you, but I think I would have sat down to put my shoes on. I would have stopped the bouncing and, and things like that. She didn't because she knew that she could. And that is such a beautiful lesson. When we believe we can, we find that way. And that's from a three-year-old to daddy. <laughs> so we can learn so much. Yes. We can learn so much from children. If we allow, I mean, if I'd have been a bit more domineering, I would have said, I said, put the ball down and pick your shoes on. Mm -hmm. But she proved otherwise. She didn't need that because she knew how to do what she needed to do. No question. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, no. no question. So we have that possibility, yeah. don't we? 
we have the possibility and we also have the conviction you know mm -hmm. I'm finding there's a, a difference between a belief and a conviction Mm -hmm. You know, when yeah. we're really strong and no, we just know <laughs> there's yeah, that I conviction. Can. Yeah. And I what we can. think That's we know the... is more like yeah. a belief, perhaps. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Th this is where we, we move on to. We move away from that conviction as yeah. we get older because of many for many reasons. We move out of it and we start moving more into the, the doubt area. Yeah. And that's a shame. Because we've all we've all got that ability. I mean, if you are around eleven months old, and obviously if if everything is is, is working well in the body and the mind, you suddenly decide at some stage that I can walk. You've no idea how, mm -hmm. but you've been seeing the adults do it, so you think I can do that. Mm -hmm. You just get up and you fall. And then you get up again and you fall and you get up again and eventually you start walking. Yeah. And when I say eventually, it's not a very, very long time. It's another month or so, but you start walking and then you can start running. But you have only achieved that because you know you've got that conviction. I can do that. Yes. And if we, we understand that mm -hmm. and we can then revivify, re relive that, that experience in, in a way, then we can understand that what else we can do mm -hmm. so maybe that right guidance then is our inner guidance yeah our knowing our we've convictions got to be exposed to it because we are often conditioned in ways which are more uh, negative i mean if you think of generally of schooling mm -hmm. when you do a homework assignment assignment or something it comes back and all you see is the mistakes yeah What's that doing to us? It's starting to limit that possibility because everything's wrong. There's, you know, that, that's, that's the general impression. You open it up, there's red lines through this, there's crosses here, crosses there. And that's what you focus on, the mistakes, the limitations. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's a shame because we have these abilities always that they get pushed down. Yeah, and it feels very deflating, humiliating, and yeah, yeah it yeah. makes us feel low, makes us feel small. Yeah. 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 And so just going back, Stuart, to you mm -hmm. being a soul whisperer, can you tell us mm -hmm. a little bit more about that? Yeah, I mean, I was in a conversation with somebody, and he just said, he's quite intuitive, he said, you're a soul whisperer, that's mm -hmm. it, you're the soul whisperer, mm -hmm. because you know, you're talking very, very deeply to my soul. And it's interesting. I didn't uh, really connect to that because, for, you know, I'd heard of the dog whisperer and this and this, the animal whisperer and that sort of thing. And it didn't really make much sense to me at the time. But afterwards, all of a sudden, people said to me, you're talking to my soul. You're talking to my soul. <laughs> and that message kept coming through. So, okay, well, he, he saw it. I didn't. And then I, it's been reinforced by so many other people. But I think it, it generally what it means is, is that I'm able to communicate in, in a way which goes much, much deeper than the surface level. And that starts from actually listening, not only to the voice, the verbals, because the big problem with language is uh, it's a set of labels. Mm. And, you know, we've, we've all heard of miscommunication, but we're, we're talking about the same thing. I mean, if, you, if I say to you, chair, you think of a chair you're familiar with, and I'm thinking of the chair I f I'm familiar with, and we both expect each other to see the same chair. Mm. But we don't, mm -hmm. because we, we've got different experiences. But that is a convenient label, yes. And, uh, you know... If we, you know, you were talking to me about mountains earlier on, you know, in the way you live. Well, the mountains I'm familiar with are these mountains in the background because this is the area I live in uh -huh. and this is a local picture. So these are very, very different than other mountains. But we're talking about the same thing, so the same basic construct, but we, we're seeing a very different picture. Yes. So we've got to see past that. Mm -hmm. and understand the mountains or the chair that the other person is talking about and find a way to get them to describe it so we can really step into their world. And when we do that, we're connecting at a much, much deeper level because we're really hearing them. And also, what emphasis, what energy are they attaching to that word? Mm 
Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, I, I was on a, a hypnotherapy training call because I've done a lot of hypnosis um, training and work and that. And one of the breakout rooms, I was with a lady and we were talking about benign attention. And for me, this just means just being there and, uh, you know, just letting it be type of thing. But she started shrinking physically. You could see she was shrinking, her energy was going down and everything else. And, and something said, there's something wrong. So we, I changed the conversation and started having a, a general conversation, finding out more about her and what she did. And it turned out she works in a terminal cancer facility. And she was seeing a lot of pain and suffering every single day. Obviously, that's, that's, you know, that's part of the experience. But cancer and tumors are associated with the word benign. So somewhere her unconscious had made a connection with this word, and that was her understanding of the word. Is this tumor cancerous and then pain and suffering, or is it benign, which is a bit of relief? And that had locked into that negativity. Mm. So she mm. couldn't work with that word because all, you know, all the negativity, negativity was being released. So I got out the thesaurus on, on, you know, on the computer and I just started giving her a few synonyms. After about five or six, ding, that was it. She just exploded into life and energy. She was so happy. Now she could understand what we've been talking about. Uh. And what the trainer had been talking about. So that word was very, very charged for her. Uh -huh. And that was her association with it. And if I hadn't have picked up on an energy switch, then we would never have made that revelation. And that's what we've got to be aware of in, in conversations with other people. Is, you know, how are they interpreting what loading, what energy is embedded in that word or that phrase for them, not for us, for them? Yeah. Yeah, and recognizing what's activated. Yeah. And for them, for our own self awareness, recognizing mm -hmm. what's activated, what's arising, you know, becoming yeah. aware of that. And again, holding space for that and just mm -hmm. witnessing it, not with judgment or shame, like you mentioned That's earlier, too, but just again. noticing noticing yeah. it and I hear what you're saying too words and attachments it reminds me of the, one of the reasons why I shifted out of my career into my mm -hmm. calling was because I didn't want to work and relate with others role to role anymore mm -hmm. you know because again there are labels or limitations there are constructs there's charge around like there's whole us mm -hmm. and them mentality for example mm -hmm. So what I really wanted to do was be able to connect soul to soul, mm -hmm. you know, and so I really understand, you know, the soul whisper, here we are, soul illuminator, connecting with the soul whisperer yep. and talking about soul. And it really is into getting into that deeper space, a deeper mm -hmm. understanding, a fuller understanding, because like you say, it's not just listening with the mind. It's not even just listening with the heart. You're mm -hmm. talking about listening with the whole body. The whole yeah. body and our all of our bodies right physical yeah. mental emotional spiritual Everything, all of yeah. it yeah and that's how we become a fuller expression of who we truly are and how we begin to harmonize with each other i think mm -hmm. when we can really tune in to each other and speak yeah, and, and, and express our truth that. Yeah. animals do that we right. we've lost that skill mm. You know, when I was traveling through Africa, we stopped in the Serengeti. We were lucky that it was a time of the migration. So we had a, we set up a camp there. And as far as you can see with binoculars, in every direction, there's just wildebeest. Oh, amazing. What was interesting was they formed a circle around our campsite oh, wow. of about 200 feet or 200 yards or something like that, a complete circle. And they're just busily, you know, eating and doing their thing and paying no attention whatsoever to us. However... You step outside that circle, sorry, outside your campsite, two meters or two, two yards, if you like, and that side of the circle of the wildebeest move back exactly that distance, but they don't look at you, they don't see you, they just continue eating the grass and doing their thing. Mm -hmm. And then you come back in again, they move back in that distance, exact distance. It's almost as if there's a rod between you and them. Uh -huh. They know. It's not just one. Nobody tells anybody else. They just do it all together. 
and then they come back again. And what can we learn from that? Mm. Total awareness, total connection to your environment, your surroundings, and just being open to the changes that are there all the time. Yeah. It's, you know, we, we just need to take some time to, to watch animals, to observe them. Even the humble birds, they know so many things. And we can grow from that. We can restore we our creatures. connection. Yeah. yeah, we are creatures of the planet and they know how to work with it. Why is it we have to destroy? I mean, who is it? Somebody said that man is the only species that destroys its home. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow it's true though isn't it if you think about it yeah yeah connection that's what i'm hearing a lot in this conversation is yeah. you know all the struggles and problems that occur when we're disconnected yeah. and how much possibility and love and joy and soul centered living comes from connection yeah, and, and as you mentioned earlier, connection to yourself mm. is one of the keys because I think a lot of people are disconnected from themselves because they're, they're in the world yeah. of distraction. They're living externally for this one, this one, this Facebook message, this Instagram message, this TikTok reel or whatever it is that <laughs> has grabbed their attention. So yeah. they're not even connected to themselves. They don't even know who they are half the time. Yeah, yeah. Something I was playing with in terms of words, because I love words, is like uh, when, uh, you know, sometimes when we're bored or we're looking for some kind of distraction, do you want to go mm -hmm. for a scroll or do you mm -hmm. want to go for a stroll? So mm -hmm. maybe instead of, you know, just scrolling, <laughs> that we actually go for a stroll and yeah. reconnect with nature. Nature offers yeah. a beautiful, natural reset. It shifts mm -hmm. our energy and it we can experience expansive space and beauty and wonder and joy through all of that. And it takes us out of, you know, just the, the screen time. We can shift it into green time, you know, going out in nature yeah. and just reconnecting that way. Yeah. And we don't have to go so far to find nature. No. You don't have to go into the wilds of Canada or the deserts of Arizona or, you know, anywhere else. You know, nature's always around us if we choose to look at it look for it yeah or it. what we can cultivate within our immediate environment yeah you know through all of our senses like essential oils or incense for smell for example or cooking food you know or baking bread or being able to do something tactile with our hands and to be able to see something beautiful like a plant or flowers or candles mm -hmm. around you and creating that ambiance yeah, and just, just yeah doing something that feeds and soothes the senses mm -hmm. and you know something which i just remembered when you were talking then a couple of years ago i mean we, in this area we've got um, a lot of cicadas they start about may and then go on to about september october oh, uh -huh. and it was i was in the, the little garden area of where we live and there's a pond there and two children were with me and the cicadas have been buzzing away. And I just stepped back. And as I stepped back, I felt something hard under my shoe. And I thought it was a stone or something. But at the same time, as I started putting weight on it, I heard this screech. Ah. So, you know, I, I wasn't going to step back hard on it. I moved my foot and looked down. It was a cicada. It come down from the trees and was looking for somewhere to, to bury itself you know, for the winter because it was uh, September, the end of August, beginning of September. And I never, ever realized or thought an insect could have a way of communicating like that and also feelings like that. Ah. I was about to crush it and it screeched <laughs> to <Wow>. say don't. <laughs> no. So we, we dismiss a lot of nature Yes, we are realizing yes. it. Mm -hmm. And there's there's something beautiful about all the creatures. It doesn't matter if they're mosquitoes, there's something beautiful because they all have a purpose. Mm -hmm. But we don't see that. We see a lot of it as a nuisance. And that is part of the disassociation we've grown up and, and, and uh, built into our lives of our true connection to this, this world, really. Exactly. And it's we're dismissing our own nature 
as well. Yeah. When we don't yeah. tune into our natural rhythms and what mm -hmm. our bodies are telling us, for example, there's just this yeah. push <laughs> and pressure and urgency that we, this mm -hmm. tightness and this rigidity that, yeah, we've kind of lost, set, well, not even lost necessarily our connection there, but dismisses dismiss it yeah. dismissing dismiss. our own needs dismissing our own natural rhythms mm -hmm. dismissing even the opportunity to breathe the next breath because we're holding it so often mm -hmm. yeah. yeah i mean you know the moon i mean if, how many people actually take time to look at the moon mm -hmm. but that is such a big influence in our lives yes and you know my my two young my two children when my youngest was just born my eldest she's only 18 months older she was about 18 months at the time she was staying with Granny because my wife's in hospital and I was with her. And uh, on the way home, she made Granny and Granddad stop the car and get out to look at the moon because <laughs> oh. it was. A <laughs> 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 but you know, again, that's something else I learned through, through teaching. Is I noticed because I was the first time, you know, the first school I was working at, I was working with the children from maybe five, five or six to about ten, and I noticed there was a lot of times where there was just no concentration nothing happening and you know luckily I was the type of person who took notes what happened what worked and what didn't work and over a, a period of time I saw this commonality okay there's a commonality and then I counted the days and I noticed it was in core um, in um, in alignment with the cycles of the moon mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself, you know, it's, it's, it's just so logical. Why, you know, why did I have to take time to see it? Because if the moon can move the water and the oceans and the massive lakes around the world, what's it going to do to us? Right. And, you know, once I understood that, I was able to work with it. Mm -hmm. So if it's coming up to a, a full moon, for instance, I go into the class with a very, very, very loose plan, but lots more games. And everybody was happy and everybody was learning. Yeah. Because yeah. they were working in rhythm with nature yes and farmers know this but we don't talk to farmers we look down on them mm. but they know this. they know so much more indigenous peoples they know so much more but again we think we're superior so we look down we judge and we miss out on so much we do and speaking of working with Stuart, i'm wondering mm -hmm. how we can offer the opportunity to work with you how would people connect with you the best way is to go to my website, stuart-elliot.com. And Stuart is S-T-U-A-R-T, -T, and Elliot is two L's and two T's, because there's four ways of spelling it and two ways yes. of spelling it. <laughs> but, you know, you probably find it's in the show notes, so if you just look at my um, name there, but it's a hyphen between, because somebody else has got the Stuart Elliot without, without the hyphen. But there's, um, you know, at the moment I'm offering a complimentary... 60 minute call with people to just have a discovery and uh, you know see how I can help them solve something in that time period and it's there's no charge to it so you know I just love to be able to give back as much as I can amazing that's so perfect Stuart that's wonderful and yeah we will make it easy for you all we'll have the links just down below the video you mm -hmm. can check that out and the free resources there the call to be able to connect is absolutely fantastic thank you so much for offering that steward and there's it's a couple a of guides you'll find from me as well to uh to engage in some soul care to really mm -hmm. be able to find your solace in everyday life and to live your passion and purpose so those guides will be down below for you as well in mm -hmm. talking about communication and soul whispering steward is there anything else that you'd like to to offer today that's coming up for you well i've got a um um what's it called I just lost the name of it. <laughs> <laughs> it's gone. Just like that. It's just gone. gone. <laughs> but, um, I'm, I'm planning to, to do later on this year. A, um, a, um, again, it's gone again. What's the word? There's a word I'm looking for. So stop looking. But, you know, one of the big challenges people have is imposter syndrome. Oh, yes. And this comes as, um, you know, from lack of self-worth and a lot of other areas. And, and, and you know, we just don't feel um, that we should be there. I mean, it happened to me a little while back. I was on the inaugural board meeting of this charity foundation I'm part of. And I'm sat there and people were talking. 
about the, their experience and everything else. And I said, Stuart, you've got nothing to offer. What, what are you doing here? And then I said, okay, go away. <laughs> I'm not listening to you. <laughs> because this was the imposter knocking. I was doubting myself. Oh, and, you know, I, we've all got a lot to offer, but unfortunately it does come there. So challenge is the word. Okay, challenge. so I'm going to do a five-day challenge in the next two weeks. Oh, great. So that will go up on the website and people will be able to register. And I'll put it out on LinkedIn because that's where uh, most of my social media is. And then later I want to do a, um, a summit on imposter syndrome, maybe in July or August, maybe in September. But Because I, it, it, it's becoming more and more recognized mm -hmm. that people have silently suffered so much over the over the years feeling lack of worth feeling like an imposter in so many different ways and it is something i don't think you can ever cure 100 percent because it's one of these things that always keeps knocking prying to see if you've really learned the lesson mm -hmm. but what you can do is you can learn to recognize it or the warning signs and then just say go away i'm not listening to you you're not knocking at my door you can keep knocking but i'm not answering you know i'm not going to be you know taken down that road yeah so that, yeah. that that's something that uh, i'm looking forward to putting on because i think so many people can get a benefit in, in in so many different ways from just understanding number one they're not alone and number two it doesn't have to take control of them Absolutely. And it's so interesting that you brought this up, Stuart, because just a couple of days ago, there was an article of mine that was published in Her Nation magazine on exactly that, how to overcome imposter syndrome for okay. good. Yeah, and, so maybe uh, yeah I'll put a link down below for that too, actually, yeah, since we're on the so. topic, <laughs> so that yeah. you can read about that as well. But yeah, a very yeah. important topic. So I'm glad that uh, mm -hmm. you're bringing together some people to be talking about that yeah, so that we can, every single we can step into has, our sovereignty. Yeah. Yeah, we, we all have value. Mm. It's just we, we've, through whatever circumstances, we've gone into doubt about our worthiness. And, you know, there's a lot of ways where our self-doubt can creep in. I mean, there's many psychiatrists you can talk to if you want to, but... Uh, um, who have worked with children who have become suicidal because their parents are arguing and they somehow have taken the blame and they become suicidal and they think, if I go, my parents will be okay. They're not seeing, it's nothing to do with them. Yeah. There's so many ways we can pick up these, these, these stories about our worth, you know, mm -hmm. and, and uh, then start living in that negative realm. So, you know, the more we can get that word out there that it's not our fault, Mm -hmm. and that is somewhere we can go to get help then the better because you know it's, it's it's not nice to be in that situation where you don't value yourself yeah yeah, yeah. and yeah. the first thing is to learn to love you because yes. you are unique you are special we're all different yes but we're all special and and here for what some reason we don't don't always know it but we're here for a reason Let's find out and let's live that beauty, which is us. Yes, and recognize that you are meant for this world. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, that's why it's so important that, number one, you know, I'm a guest here, but number two, the work you're doing and connecting people to their own sovereignty and things like that. I mean, it's, it's, it's so needed in all this nonsense that's around the world today. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you so much, Stuart. And thank you for each and every one of you that are showing up today and perhaps you're joining us every week. I do encourage you to keep coming back. So be sure to subscribe if you haven't already and hit that notification bell so you never miss an episode. Stuart, thanks again so much for being here. I really appreciate you and everything that you shared today. Well, it's my absolute pleasure and honor. And obviously, you know, it isn't about listening to me on my own. It's about coming and listening to all the wonderful people with all their stories and hearing just how much possibility lies within each one and every one of us as once we decide to recognize it. Indeed. Thank you so much. Thank you.